On today's episode of Women of Impact, Dr. Shafali exposed the lies we have been conditioned to believe that hold us back from having the life we dream of. So when we are given something imposed on us in such a stringent way, it stops us from discovering who it is we are. A clinical psychologist, a New York Times best-selling author, and the woman whose work Oprah Winfrey called revolutionary and life-changing sheds light on all the myths and beliefs we have been told about love, marriage, motherhood, beauty, and yes, even niceness. It's a consumer society that preys on women's desire to be eternally beautiful and youthful and it's a lie. So how do we free ourselves from false beliefs in order to show up every day as our true authentic selves? We are at war with our own bodies because of this inner critic and we women need to say no more. Get ready for the surprising answers on today's Women of Impact with the incredible Dr. Shafali. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shafali. Thank you for having me. You know, we've been wanting to do this for a long time, so I'm so excited. I know, me too. Your book is absolutely freaking amazing. And there's one set part of it that is the thing that I really want to dive deep on. And that's the lies that we've been told. And I actually want to start with a quote, because before I think we get into the actual lies, I want to talk about how we end up with these lies in the first place. Right. And I've heard you very eloquently talk about our belief system. Mm -hmm. and. It is, this quote is literally the opposite to how I thought, which is why I freaking want to go deep. I love it. We think they empower us when in fact they limit us. We believe that we will be nothing without our beliefs when in fact the opposite is true. We only realize who we are when we are stripped of them. Instead of finding we are nothing, we find that they are nothing. Instead of finding that we need them to survive, we realize that they have blocked us from thriving. Talk to me about that because I go so strong on the power of belief, but you've just kind of like knocked it down and I love like new ideas. So sure. So ever since we are really small, we are given subconsciously by our families and by our culture a prescription list, which is the ways we should be, the ways we should act and behave, and especially for little girls how to be silent and good and kind and skinny or not, or beautiful or not. And all those pressures come with those prescription lists that our mothers live out, our culture lives out, and we unconsciously oppress ourselves with. So when we are given something imposed on us in such a stringent way, it stops us from discovering who it is we are. Mm. So the beliefs become a noose, a cage. They are superimposed belief systems. They're not something we come into on our own through a careful wisdom and evolution. No, they're given to us. Our belief in God, our belief in grades, our belief in achievement, our belief in beauty, youth, marriage, parenthood. We ingest these belief systems and then we robotically follow them. Mm -hmm. So they encage us, they don't liberate us. I love that so much. And as you were talking, it reminded me of, I was brought up Greek Orthodox, never questioned it. You're Greek Orthodox, God, God exists. And no one had ever questioned it because I was brought up in a very typical Greek community. And I met my husband, Tom, and one of the first things he ever asked me was like, oh, do you believe in God? And I was like, yeah. He goes, why? Yeah. And I was like, because uh, my dad told me to. <laughs> I didn't have an answer, Dr. Shafari. Right. And in that moment, I think that's what you're talking about, is that we're so robotic yes. in what we've been told and then living in accordance. Yes. And so we're puppeteered robotically like zombies mm. to believe things because our parents believed in them. <laughs> and I take each of these belief systems in this book and I debunk them not to be rebellious for the sake of rebellion, but really to reduce our suffering because a lot of these belief systems have been nooses around our neck, caged us, stifled us in fear, and left us women in particular, puddles on the floor, disenfranchised, lost, and scared to speak our truth. So I debunk belief systems to give us a voice, to give us power, to know that the belief doesn't come before your own self-belief. God, I love that so much. All right, so take me down these debunking. So I want to start with love and then I'd love to debunk it and then say how we can then think about it in a different way. Yes. 
So this whole idea of falling in love is really lunacy. You shouldn't fall. You know, I always say, don't fall. Please just be on your feet and be solid in your center. Mm. But we've been sold this ro romantic, you know, this princess Pollyanna fantasy of you fall. Mm -hmm. Where are you falling? <laughs> you know, you're falling into craziness. Anyway, say you fall into love. The first year, at least, by now when you're an adult, you know that you're not even showing up as your true self. You're showing up as the mask you've been wearing. So you're really falling in love with the idea that someone loves you. So you're falling in love with an idea which is coming from an emptiness. Then we don't stop there. We all know that love for the most part, when it is like this, you know, do you love me? Do you see me? Do you want me? Mm -hmm. It's all about me. It's all about my emptiness. Mm -hmm. And it's a transaction. Because the minute that person looks to the other one, we're like, I hate you. Mm. <laughs> and we're like, what happened to, my to the love? Because we are conditional beings. We are highly transactional. So love is a transaction. It's a bartering exchange system. You give me this, I give you this. And when that falls apart, the whole relationship falls apart. Yeah. And then there's an agenda to love. Now you have to get married, right? So there's a goal, mm -hmm. there's a finite quality. It is defined in a very prescribed way. The ring, the engagement, the marriage, and women especially are trained, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, that if the partner does not give you a ring and doesn't propose and doesn't commit, there is no love. That's not true love. And how are you equating true love with a goal? <laughs> right? So love is very much uh, an, an idea, an agenda. It is something that uh, we have bought into as a fantasy. And most of us have conditional love. I say this about parents and children. You know, it's not really unconditional. We're falling in love with the other's ego that falls in love with our ego. And then after two years, when we finally show up with our inner child, the other one panics because they're like, I thought you would be my mother. And the other one is like, I thought you'd be my father. Mm -hmm. And they both have fallen apart because they, they're both wounded from inside. Why do you think it's so important that people, because I actually completely agree with the, everything you're saying, but people like the idea of unconditional love. But conditional love is very healthy. Yeah. So in my relationship, I say to my, I don't have unconditional conditional love for my husband. If he ever beats me or if he ever cheats yes. on me, he's gone. Yes. And so to me, that's healthy. Right. It's such a delusion to act as if we have unconditional love. Right. Now you could still love his essence, right. but in the working relationship, there are conditions, mm -hmm. but we're acting like there are no conditions, mm -hmm. yet it's full of conditions. Mm -hmm. And so when the condition shows up, we don't know how to work through them. Right. Yeah. Then it's a betrayal. But it was always there. The condition is always there. And there should be conditions. Those are called boundaries. Mm -hmm. Those are called, you know, my standards, what I need. And we should fl flourish ourselves with conditions that allow us to blossom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, why don't you think we allow ourselves then? Because we've been sold this romantic idea of unconditional love. And if we don't have that or we don't prescribe to that, then, then what kind of love, right? right? Then it scares us to create these negotiations, these conditions, which are actually healthy mm -hmm. because they're honest, they're authentic. But we don't believe that's love. That takes away from the romance. And that, I love that you said that because I think that we get caught up in the romance yes. and forget what the romance is supposed to be a part of. Right. What is the romance supposed to be a part of? It's supposed to be the part of two humans seeking deeper connection and intimacy. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean possession, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean I own you and you better do what I want. How is that love, right? So love in its essence is a free emotion mm -hmm. and we've bottled it into a prescription. But true love is freedom. That's how the parent can best love their children. That's how we can best love our girlfriends and our boyfriends and the best way we can love our intimate partners. But when it comes to intimate partners, because there's so many, so many stereotypes, we really begin to think that the intimate partner belongs to us. Mm. Yeah, God, I love that. And as you were talking, it really has been set up, you know, with 
let's say, movies growing up on Disney films, the right. princess story that you wait to be saved. Right. Um, and, you know, the happily ever after. Yeah. And I kind of joke and say, I'm happily ever working on my relationship. Yes. You know, because it's, if you think that there's going to be this happy ending, then I think it means that you then don't push or work for it. And then there's a surprise where you're like, huh, this isn't the fairy tale that I was prescribed Right. to at the beginning right. when I was a child. Right, and that's where the fairy tale ends when the real relationship begins. Oh. You know, because they don't talk about the next pages, which is a deep commitment to growth. But if both are not committed to growth and working on themselves and improving and evolving, then that's when the relationship can become toxic and dysfunctional mm -hmm. and deaden, you know? But nobody talks about that. It's, it's work as in inner work, mm -hmm. right? The relationship should be aligned both should be a match for each other. They should both want to grow. And all of that comes from inner work. Mm -hmm. But people don't want to do the inner work that it takes to be in a deeply connected relationship. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. And I want to go to the next one then that really hit me, which is motherhood. Yeah. So I grew up Greek Orthodox, thought I was going to have four kids, massive family. I then find myself, realize I love business. And then I go from being married for over 10 years saying to Tom, hey, when are we going to have kids? When are we going to have kids? To saying, I don't want children anymore. Um, and the backlash and the um, societal pressures and judgment on my decision wow. was really hard and really struggled. And so I'd love to just go deep yeah, on- But I have a question. So please. how did you come to that decision? And I think that's so helpful for so many. You're going to say it better than me mm -hmm. because women should have the choice to choose motherhood or not. Just because your biology allows you to be a mother doesn't mean you need to be a mother and you're always mothering anyway. But you chose not to actively bear children. So tell us, I'm going to interview yeah. you. <laughs> tell us about that choice because that's what women need to allow themselves to weigh that option for themselves. And thank you so much for saying that because the lie I told myself and I had was if I choose not to have children, then I'm not motherly. Yes. See? And that held me back from saying out loud I didn't want to be a mother yes. because it didn't compute with how I felt. Yes. Because part of me is like, but I love taking care of I'm people. I'm taking care of everyone all yeah, the time. Yeah. Yes. But because I choose not to bear a child. Yes, there's a big distinction between biologically bearing a child mm -hmm. and being a mother. Mm -hmm. You are a mother, you know, and you hold that principle. But anyway, so tell me, so how did you come, to, like if you went from the condition lie, mm -hmm. did you wake up one morning? Oh, so no. So I was supporting my husband for eight years. He was going to work every day. We had agreed that he was going to go be an entrepreneur, make enough money for us to come together and make movies. That was the goal. So I was like, oh, babe, I'll support you. You go out and work. I'll do everything else. And we're a team. Mm -hmm. It would just take 12 months. Yeah. Just 12 months. Yeah. Of course, 12 months it yeah. never existed. And it ended up being eight years. Right. And so what happened was the first year I'm, I'm supporting. It's a team. By year five, forgot totally about who I was, what the goal was. By year eight, mm -hmm. I was needing something to fill my life because mm -hmm. I had lost myself mm -hmm. so completely. Mm -hmm. And so by then I was like, we need children. When are we going to have kids? I'm Greek. I've been married for a long time. I'm getting people to ask me. And then one day, I'll cut the story short, Tom came home. He's like, we want to start a new protein bar company. Do you mind just helping? Well, I'm the great supportive wife. Right. Of course I'll help, babe. Right. So rolling pins, knives, right. I'll ship from my living room floor. Right. I'm a great supportive wife. Right. But what we didn't expect was that protein bar would turn into Bequest. Mm -hmm. That would grow at 57,000%. Mm -hmm. That me shipping from my living room floor within two years took me to building an entire shipping department, 40 employees. And mm -hmm. in that process where I knew nothing, I didn't know what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I was falling every single day on my face, facing my inadequacies every single day, but our house was on the line. And I prided myself of being a good wife. Mm -hmm. So every day that I stumbled, every day I didn't know what I was doing, I had two things, save your house, be a good wife. Mm -hmm. Save your house, be a good wife. Mm -hmm. Now in that process, I started to find me. Mm. I started to see what I was capable of. Mm. I started to be on fire. I no, no longer waited for Tom to come home and make me feel mm. a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, like, I love this. And then every day 
every day was just a little chip of, I'm really loving this. And then I started to feel guilty right. that I no longer felt like I wanted children, that I no longer was right. thinking. It was the furthest thing from my mind. Right. So because of that, I then opened up the discussion with right. Tom, talking to him about how good I was loving my life. Yeah. And I didn't know if I wanted children anymore. And I was worried about getting judged right. for it. And at the end of the day, we have a very open communication. And right. he just said, look, what kind of husband would I be? Seeing how happy you are now right. and try and take that away from you. Right. And so in that process, I kind of just looked at my life, looked at what well, how I say is, what does an average Wednesday look like? Mm -hmm. Because I think we can get caught up in the feeling of being pregnant. I know I can at least. Mm -hmm. Get caught up in the feeling of being pregnant. Mm -hmm. Get caught up in the feeling of having that child the day it's born, mm -hmm. celebrating its birthday. Mm -hmm. I can get caught up in that, mm -hmm. and I know I can. Mm -hmm. I can even get caught up in seeing a little Tom run around like with his ears. Oh, my God, I would lose my mind, Dr. Shafali. <laughs> So I can convince myself all the reasons why I would love having a child. Right. And then I just ask, what does a Wednesday look like? Right. And the truth is, I love working. I love grinding. I love going hard. Yeah. And so that was how I came to the conclusion. But then it took me over a year sure. for me and Tom deciding to say it out loud. Yeah. Because I did get hate. I actually, I got someone saying, you were so selfish. selfish. Yes. Imagine your parents never had you. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't yeah, be great. here to have to yeah, judge yeah, on it. I wouldn't be imagining. <laughs> exactly. So I got yeah. so much backlash, yeah. so much hate. And it really, because I'm just stubborn enough, it didn't stop me. But that's why I really love that you address motherhood and in And look book. what pressure women have to go through. You had to go through internal agony to just say, mm, not for me. Right? You were judged, you were shamed, you yourself had a great crisis of yourself. Like, who am I? Am I really a selfish person? Am I not motherly? Right? So th this is what I mean, that, that just because we can biologically bear children, we have been sold the lie that our goodness, our caring, our mothering comes to rely on whether we actually physically bear children. It's a lie. They're not even connected. So that was a lot of working through. And we women deserve to not have to work through so much. Mm. So I'm offering women the permission to understand that you don't have to be a mother. But then I also talk about how mothers don't have to identify with being mothers either. Oh, yeah. Let's talk more about yeah, that. Because, you know, I'm a mother mm -hmm. and I've seen how crazy we mothers are mm -hmm. and drive our children crazy. Because now we identify with the actual mother-child relationship. Mm -hmm. And we make that our PhD, our career, mm -hmm. our relationship, our lover. Mm. We fulfill our needs through the mother-child or parent-child relationship. And the child becomes that object that we use to fulfill our inner needs. So I teach mothers to release that identity, to find your own wholeness through your child. You can't find your wholeness through your child. So stop trying to make your child the perfect child because you want to be the perfect person. Stop trying to make your child the competent one because you feel incompetent. So motherhood has a lot of pressure. Once you become a mother, oh my God, the pressure on that mother to be the perfect mother, to raise the perfect child. And that's what I help mothers also release from, that there is no such thing as a perfect mother and there is no perfect child. So stop identifying as the perfect mother because you will drive yourself and your kid crazy. So that's what happens to us. We get so tethered to that identity mm -hmm. that not having it freaks us out. We're terrified. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we start breaking that then so that we don't pass it on to our children and our children's children? Well, it's through the process of wisening up to understand that culture has sold us a lie. It's not true. It's not true. The whole idea around motherhood, for example, or that my goodness comes from mothering is a lie. The two are not connected. So we have to do this dismantling process. Right. How do you for do ourselves. that? Yeah. Well, books like this will help you to get the permission. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one mother said to me, she was so grateful because I gave her the permission. You won't believe what I gave her permission for to not give her kid breakfast in the morning because the kid wanted to eat only after like one or two. Her, her, the kid's palate was not opening. You know how sometimes mm -hmm. not a morning person? The mother tortured herself 
to serve the best breakfast. Now, this is so simple. People need permission. So books like this give you permission to have a paradigm shift. You know, once I told her, who said we need to eat breakfast? F the breakfast. She's like, really? Really? I can F the breakfast? Okay. That's so amazing. So you needed permission to go F motherhood. Yeah. You don't need it. Yeah. You're full. You're complete. You're whole. Or for somebody else, it could be F marriage. Mm. Right? We need the permission to believe that there are other options so that we can still feel worthy without what culture has told us. So culture has really... Uh, curated us into a, you know, museum piece. You know, you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Mm -hmm. And these prescriptions become nooses around our neck. Look what happened to you. You suffered so much around this one fundamental decision. So if you had just released the pressure that everyone was putting on you, that you had to make a decision right now, you know? Yes. Plus, a lot of people say, you know, society is, your purpose is to have children, yes. your entire purpose in life. Right. And even to the point where I was very confident, I decided I'm not going to have kids. I knew it. I'd said it out loud. I, you know, really believed in it. And I go to the doctors because I hadn't had a period in 10 years. And I kept going to the doctors, finally went to the doctors. I was like, like please do scan something, like something's wrong. Right. So they do, and they find that I have polycystic ovary syndrome. And so the doctor comes in, she comes in with a little notepad and she looks at me and she's like, Okay, so yeah, we actually sound, found some cysts on your, you know, ovaries and blah, blah, blah. You, have, you haven't had a period in a while. And she lies, oh, but you don't want children. Is that correct? And I said, yeah. And she goes, oh, well, then you're fine. No worries. Come back next year. Right. And I was like, I'm sorry. I have a health condition. Right. But because my ovaries aren't going to have children, then, I, then who cares if my body's still in disarray? Right. Like, I was so horrified, yes. Dr. Shafali. Yes. But this is a professional. Yes. Now, when you think about those small little things that are dripping on us women every day. Every single day. I only have one daughter. Look how I even just said. I just said I only have. Right, right, right. Because I feel I'm supposed to be saying sorry. Right. Again, to whom? I had one child. I was told, oh, you only have one. So I began saying, I only have one. Mm -hmm. Like I felt embarrassed, ashamed. Mm -hmm. Now I should have two at least because that's a happy family. Mm -hmm. Then once we have the child, we have to spring back into our pre-natal <laughs> bodies. And now that's healthy. I mean, and then we have to go back to work and then we have to breastfeed for 10 years and then we have to make cookies and drop them off at school, walking in a, you know, it's like so much pressure now. Mm -hmm. Life isn't simple as it could be. And part of our lack of simplicity, part of our complexity is because we believe belief systems that are not true. Yeah, that's why I love it because you really do break all those down. And I think it's really important to debunk them, realize that the way that you're thinking like is holding the noose around your neck. Yes. I really love that metaphor, yes. by the way. And then just going, okay, so now what do I want to be? Who do I want to yes. be? Because the second I started to break myself of that yeah. with, okay, all society keeps telling me people are saying I'm selfish, but like I'm not a good wife because yes. I'm not providing for my husband yes. anymore. I'm not cooking for him. Right. So I was like, hang on. Like once I started to build my own self-esteem, my own confidence, I stopped and I was like, what does a good wife look like to me? Yeah. Like to Lisa Billy, what does a good wife look like? Mm -hmm. And it's like to have my, to, if my husband actually said these words, I need you, that I would be there. Yeah. But he doesn't abuse it. I don't abuse it with him. We right. say it maybe once a year, right. you know, and that if he knows, like if he wants support, I'm going to be there for him. But just like if I want support, he's going to be there for me. And also I have some traditional things inside. I love cooking for him. Mm -hmm. I hate doing on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. but I like seeing him, like the smile he gets. Mm -hmm. So every Saturday, I cook for him. Mm -hmm. And that's my balance. Mm -hmm. Monday to Friday, you're on your own. Right. You have to clean, you have to do your own food, right. you have to get your own clothes. But on Saturday, for my own sake, yeah. for what I value right. in being a wife to my husband, right. it is providing a meal for him. Right. You decided, you came to the place of redefining it. Maybe you would have said, oh, I can only cook seven times for you. I want to cook 14 times. You can go that way, exactly. you can go this way. But the fact is that you discerned it for yourself mm -hmm. and you deconstructed what does it mean for me. Not what culture decides is good. What I decide is authentic, real for Lisa. And that's what we want women to do through this book is here's the process by which you were fooled or seduced or lied to. Mm -hmm. Now here are the tools 
to break it down for yourself. And when you do, you live a more powerful life, more authentic life, more real, more, more sovereign life. I love that. All right, now on to the next okay. life, beauty and youth. Yes. Talk to me about that. Well, you know, you know, you and I have shared how growing up we were so commented upon for our looks either you're too skinny or you're too fat or you're too chubby or you're too pretty or you're not so pretty you know we constantly got comments objectifying us for how we looked mm. and it tortured us mm. even if the co comments were sometimes positive oh yeah talk to me about that yeah so you know when people don't realize that anytime something is overly praised and it's nothing to do with our internal, it's something to do with our external, either our achievement, competence, or our beauty for women, especially. Then we identify with that. And then when we're not that, or we see ourselves not being that, it makes us feel like we are worthless mm. because we've been told we are the achievement or we are the beauty. So if we're not that, then who are we? So even if it's like, you're so beautiful, now it's a bloody pressure. Now I have to keep being that beautiful. How do you keep being beautiful? It puts pressure on you to be perfect, to be amazing. And this is something I tell parents, be careful when you praise your kid for something external because they will identify with that as being the way to get worth and you screw them up for life and they can't dis disentangle from that, you know? So either by being called too fat or being called too skinny, you're gonna get messed up because you identify with that comment. And culture has so much judgment around how we look. You know, we are raised with a very particular standard of beauty. Women know it. Sometimes it's the voluptuous look, sometimes it's the anorexic look, it doesn't matter. There's always a look that we're all like sheep trying to look like. Do you see the trends? Yeah. Don't subscribe to the standard of beauty don't subscribe to this idea of youth because you can't hold on to your youth. And don't mutate your body to serve the needs of this patriarchy. But it's really we women competing with each other. Yeah. You know, who are we trying to look better than? Our sisters. For the sake of what? So we have to examine the ways our insecurities are breeding this overcompetitiveness and how we're mutating our bodies, injecting all sorts of implants and spending hours in front of the mirror and critiquing ourselves. You know, we are so harsh on ourselves because we have internalized the oppressive voice of this toxic patriarchy. Mm. The internal critic is brutal. It's, it's way harsher than any societal I know, comments absolutely. that I get, for yeah. sure. We are the ones looking in the mirror and dissecting the wrinkle here, the earlobe hanging here, <laughs> you know, the, the little cellulite. The, no one from the outside is doing it. We are at war with our own bodies because of this inner critic. And we women need to say no more. I, I got tired of being at war. So I was like, okay, either I starve myself or I accept, you know, and I went on this radical acceptance a decade ago that I have big hips according to culture. Okay, it's I was all relative. Say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I go to another culture, they'll be like, you're so tiny. Yes. So I'm very aware. It's in, I'm, fa I'm really glad you said everything's all relative. It's all relative, right? Um, and in this culture, they're considered big. And in this culture, I feel really shitty about my big hips. So I'm going to decide that I won't let culture own me. And I'm going to own my own hips and the cellulite that it comes with, you know. And, but, but I see the inner critic because of what culture has done to me. But I can separate now from it and go, that's the voice of culture. That's the voice of the magazines. That's the voice of the standard of beauty. And I'm not going to buy into it, mm -hmm. but it's a war because we've been so oppressed by it. If I said to you, Lisa, wow, you have, <laughs> you have wrinkles around your eyes. 100% I've ruined your day. Yes. Why? Because wrinkles are apparently a curse word. And I'm like, why do I not like the wrinkles? Because I've been taught to not like wrinkles. Mm -hmm. I've been taught that wrinkles means I'm growing old and apparently growing old is a terrible thing to do. We should have flawless skin. What is this rubbish, flawless skin? You know, nobody has flawless skin. That's why we cover up our skin with makeup. I mean, this is a tragedy. I fall into it too. Don't, I mean, I'm here to be mm. real and human, but I can begin to see how I only suffer 
when I castigate myself, mm. you know, and I'm learning for myself to neutralize the word cellulite, fat, thin, wrinkles, old. These are judgmental words in culture when actually they're just parts of life. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be judgments. But if, if you tell someone, wow, you look really mature and old. Apparently that's a curse. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And I totally hear what you're saying. It's the stigma we have against yes. those words themselves. The stigma, they're loaded words. So if my daughter said, mommy, I'm flabby, mm -hmm. I would want to protect her against the judgment of culture and say, no, you're not. You're beautiful. But I'm trying to say in this book is, I tell my daughter now, that's your body. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you want me to do? It is what it is. Love it. If she's like, I'm too short, it's your body. I'm too tall, it's your body. Accept your body. Don't fight it mm -hmm. and don't fight aging. I mean, I'm growing old and I want to like inject and plump and the more that's available, it's like a candy store. Oh, I'll take some of that. Mm -hmm. I'll take some of some fat here and some, but I know that that's going to attack my essence. It's going to feed my insecurity. The real empowerment will come when I can look at the wrinkle and go, okay, I accept, right? That's where we need to go. And that's what this book teaches women, how to deal with their insecurities, not to obliterate them, mm. not to necessarily never wear makeup. It's just mm. to see the hunger that lies beneath. Yeah, God, I love that. And I know you also said actually that, which I love because you're so honest and raw and that is what resonates with me so much. And I love that you really do point out, it's like, look, we all do cover being admired. Yes. And I think that that's it, right? Is that we admire someone, right? Like I look across right. from you and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so stunning. Yes. Your hair's amazing, girl. Your eyes are yes. like literally. And so it's like, I am admiring you. Yes. So because I admire you, I think, oh, if I look like her, then I will feel yes. as good as, as I admire. I She's feeling. Correct. Because I admire her Correct. so much. And, and that's where we get faulty because it's natural to want to be desired, but it's not natural the degree to with, with which we are chasing being desired mm. in today's era. We have become abnormal and extreme in wanting everyone on social media, strangers to adulate us, everyone to be a fan and a follower. We've become so hungry. We've become narcissistic mm. now. We, because we can fix every part of our body, doesn't mean we should, mm -hmm. right? Just because everything is available right now in terms of surgery, doesn't mean we need to. We're losing our essence. We're losing our body. You know, that's what makes us so unique. But now we're all trying to look the same. Mm -hmm. We're all putting on the same kind of makeup and trying to have the same kind of jaw. And we're looking like replicas of each other instead of true unique versions of ourselves. Mm. So I just see us as a tragedy right now, chasing for things to fill us, to look the same. You know, I teach my daughter, you cannot be your best friend, but what makes you you is what can never make her her. Now how to teach this? It's so hard, especially when you're young. Yeah. It's so hard because you do compare yourself yes. to your friends yes. and you don't see, you know, when you're young, yeah. everyone does want to fit in because you want to be liked and accepted. Absolutely. I, I see her friends wearing contact lenses of different colors and changing mm -hmm. their hair because they're trying to fit in. But I hope that this next generation will have greater worth than we did. Yeah. Agreed, yeah. And I've really kind of processed me as I get older and as I change and the wrinkles and things like that. I don't have anything against plastic surgery, but the thing that I do tell yeah. myself is, how is it going to affect my mind? Yeah. Because that's the thing. If it's something that can empower me, I'm always for empowering. Yes. But I actually completely hear yeah. that to me, for myself, there was really no judgment on anyone else. But for me, I know that it would be a trigger to then start things of not accepting other things about myself, yeah. which is why I don't start yeah. because I know myself well enough that it would be a downward spiral. Yes, and that's the key. I'm not against it at all. You know, when I gave birth and I had a C-section, I had a misfiguring here and I had to redo it. Mm. And I went through a lot of shame. Oh, you want to do plastic surgery, right? So either way, there's shame, right? If you don't do yes. it. Yes. I'm not against it at all. But again, that you have to discern for yourself. Is this going to set you off on a cascade? Will you know when to stop? Is this going to give you what you were looking for? Mm. 
Or is it going to set you up now for wanting more and more, right? And each woman has to decide that for themselves. Mm -hmm. And if it's a little bit here or a little bit there and it's really going to help you, of course. But don't do it because you think that if I look like that, I would be happier because you're not happier. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And with the age thing, I just think, okay, I actually had a guest that told me this and it hit me so hard. I remembered it ever since. And it was like, well, you've got two choices. Get older or die. And I'm like, it's so matter of fact, but I'm like, you're so right. right. Like, don't we all want to get older? But women are told that they cannot look old. That's why. Look at the mm. difference between a 50-year-old man on average and a 50-year-old woman. She's coloring her hair. She's doing her hair. She's got her eyebrows done. She's got ev- all done up. And the guy is just hanging loose, mm. raying, losing his hair, punch. He's not so concerned mm. as she is mm-hmm. because we've been stereotyped to be desired for our youth and our beauty. And part of it, I was, you know, discussing with Tom in another interview, part of it is biological, but we've gone so far in wanting it, we've stopped accepting the natural process of aging. Yeah. And we have to, we have to claim that back. Culture is not going to, culture is always going to sell us. You can be flawless and youthful for the rest Mm -hmm. of your life. It's going to lie so that we buy products. How many creams do you have? Right, this anti-wrinkle, this anti-aging. We all buy. Oh yeah, totally. You know? I have like a whole. I could open a pharmacy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> because I'm thinking that serum is going to do the trick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's and then nice. you look three weeks later, and you're like, did it work? Did yeah, it, did work? it work? And it's all the same, right? So <laughs> it's it's a consumer society that preys yeah. on women's desire to be eternally beautiful and youthful Mm -hmm. and it's a lie yeah and I get really like because I love business I really get torn because it's like well companies wouldn't exist if people weren't buying their product right they would just go bankrupt like if you have a product that no one is buying you wouldn't exist so it's this perpetual refeeding itself because companies open up women go oh you can make me younger so we buy it the company gets more wealthy right because it's right. succeeding because right. people are buying the product right. so then it becomes this perpetual thing of oh this works so keep doing it right well it doesn't work and it never works but there's an illusion that it could work because it works for the short term so i mean it works as in uh, people the, the are cycle. buying yeah, it the cycle works beautifully correct so companies create a need to solve the need. Right, right, right. So you create the need to solve the need. But it, that's where the consumer, especially us women, need to go, ah, I'm fine being old. I'm fine with my wrinkles. I'll just use this basic face cream and end the, the profit making. But I, it's anti-entrepreneurial. I get it. But we got to stop feeding our own insecurities. And that's the thing. Even like as you're talking, I'm like, everything you're saying, I agree but I'm still going to go tonight, take my makeup off and put that into anti recall No, we on. will. But it's how many and how much. And how it affects you emotionally, yes, I think. Like, yes. if you're like, this has to work, otherwise I like, won't feel good. That's what we're talking about. If uh, It's contingent on our worth. If yes. you have two face creams, two pairs of shoes, two this and two that. We saw during the coronavirus pandemic how we all downsized. We were mm-hmm. wearing, I don't know about you, no I wore shoes. the same, no shoes, no bra, <laughs> same five outfits, yes. and I barely combed my hair. Oh, just the same shirt. The I like same five the t-shirts, right? So now it made me realize, and for myself, I've put a moratorium on buying new clothes. Mm. I'm scared to even say it, but I, I realized I don't need new clothes. I could have lived in those five t-shirts for the rest of my life. Mm. So I want to contribute towards the end of this madness in my way and stop feeding myself. How many shoes do I need? Mm. I'm embarrassed now when I look at my closet because I was so sparse during Corona. Mm. I was only living off the same 10 things. And when I look at my closet now, I go, who was that person? Mm. And the jewelry, I mean, I'm embarrassed. I never used Mm. to go without earrings and jewelry. And now I can't put it on anymore. But did you hear that plastic surgery has actually gone up because on Zooms you look at yourself. Can you imagine? Because of Zoom now, I just heard about it. So now tell me, if everything is going to feed our insecurity, that's what this book teaches Mm. women. Don't buy into the madness because there's no end to the madness. And this book really empowers women to find their true warrior, their inner goddess, their sovereign queen. You know, I talk about the queen energy. When we begin to occupy the power that this book speaks to, sure, we'd still wear the earring and you'd wear the watch and but you won't be hungry and you won't feel lesser than without it. And that's liberation. 
I can be with the watch or without the watch. I'm as powerful. That's liberation. I freaking love that. All right, now let's talk about niceness. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, you know, just quickly, you know, women have been indoctrinated to be sweet and kind and obedient and loving. And uh, what are other words? Good, yes. good, right? So little girls take that in and we believe that if we're not nice, aka the bitch or a slut, oh my goodness, we are to be ashamed mm -hmm. and we are not worthy. So we try very hard to be very nice. So we allow people to invade our boundaries. We allow people to get their way. We shut up when we should be speaking up. We're waiting to protest. We take a long time before we go, uh, that I should have said no to. So our mandate needs to change from being nice to being real, to being authentic. Mm -hmm. So when my daughter is not so nice, but she's damn authentic, mm -hmm. like she'd be like, mom, I really don't need your opinion right now. I'm like, you're so mean. <laughs> Right? Because that's what I, you're so mean. And she'd be like, I'm just telling you the truth. So I would rather that than her being fake to be nice for my ego. Mm. So this is a big one for women because we really want to be the good girl, the people pleasers, the saviors, fix everyone else's life. And then we lose ourselves. And slowly by the time we're 50 or 60, we are a speck of who we were. That's why we want the grandchildren to repeat the cycle <laughs> again, you know? Can I please now take care of grandchildren? Now, there's no harm in being a nurturer, but it's, if it's a pattern, robotic pattern, then we need to question it. Yeah. I, I saw a video where you said, you, it was something like, we just need to embrace being called a bitch. Yeah. Talk to me about that, because I literally laughed out loud when I heard you say because, that. Because, you know, because we've been so trained that being nice is the way to be, at least for me, every time I heard the word bitch, I would lose it. You know, I'd get depressed. I think the person didn't love me. I think he had, they had insulted me. Now, they had, may have meant it as an insult because it's meant as an insult. But I began to reframe it and I began to realize the only time I was being called a bitch is because I was like standing up. I was pushing back. I was going, no, I was being dominating and people didn't like that. So I was a bitch. So once I understood why I was being called a bitch, I made friends with the term bitch so that I could keep being the bitch. And because if you, if you can't take it and you take it as an insult, you shrink away from it back to nice girl and you lose your voice. So I'm like, call me what you want. Call me an idiot. Call me a dumb, call me anything. Once you begin to deconstruct that these are just labels, mm. projections from people and culture have nothing to do with your essence. You're like, I get it. I can see why you think I'm dumb. I, I can see why you think I'm a bitch. It's all in your own movie. It has nothing to do with me. Because I'm disagreeing with you, I'm suddenly dumb. Because I'm disagreeing with you, I'm suddenly a bitch. I get it. I understand. I respect you. You have every right to hate me. You have every right to judge me. I don't believe I'm entitled to people's approval. Mm -hmm. And I'm not desiring of it either. But I'm certainly not entitled to be liked by anyone, including my child. Everyone can have their own relationship with me. The key is, do I have a relationship with me? And when you get really centered in that power, I love me, I like me, I back me up. Yeah, I make mistakes, yeah, I F up all the time, but I got me. Once you become your own lover, your own partner, your own best friend, your own parent, now that's liberation. You're not like seeking people to give you what you want. And do you repeat that to yourself then? Because in those moments, right, where yeah. especially like if it's someone close to you, like your daughter or yeah. a parent or a best yeah. friend or a partner, when someone is saying like whether, you know, they're calling you a bitch or something else, in those moments, you still want to be liked, right? And it still does sting. So how... Oh, it hurts terribly. But because I'm a therapist and I do this work all the time and I'm helping people deconstruct out of that hurt, yeah. I can do it faster for myself. So how would you advise someone right. like... So the, I realize and I teach people that the part that's hurt is not your true essence. Your true essence is not hurtable. Your true essence is not destructible. Your true mm -hmm. essence is not rejectable. What's getting hurt is your idea that you need that person to approve of you. What's getting hurt is your, your void your emptiness, your, your, your empty self, you know, the need is getting hurt. The need is being rejected. If you are touching your true self, nobody can hurt you. And guess what? That person is not hurting you from their true self. They're hurting you from their ego because they're hurt. 
So once you understand it's just a game of like mirrors, smokes and mirrors, you're like, okay. That yeah. hit me so hard. I that know. was so it's good. A, it's, it's liberation when you understand what is getting hurt. There's no such thing as you are hurt. Yeah. There are aspects of you. There's the true self and the false self. The false self is getting hurt. Mm. The ego is rejected. The true self is unrejectable. Now, when you live in your true self, imagine the liberation because you are the queen. You know, you're not destructible. So all of us have a true self waiting to welcome you. All of us have a true self waiting to, to contain you, to hold you. We have divorced ourselves from our true self. The true self is like, come, come to me. If you live within me, you will never be hurt. You, you, sure, you'll be sad, you'll be happy, but you won't be devastated anymore because I got you. And that's what this book does is take women from their lost self, their false self, back home to their true self. Ooh, that was so good. The last thing I want to touch on, which again, it was like, I love how you're, the language you use in the book. I love how sometimes I think I know where you're going to go and then you, you know, throw a right hook at, you know, I don't see it coming. But you talk about toxic femininity, which I've very often spoken on the show about masculine, fem yes. uh, toxic masculinity, but I'd never heard of the toxic femininity. Yes. Can you break that down for me? Well, when that niceness becomes servility, mm. when adaptability becomes lostness. You know, the good qualities of the feminine, the good qualities, the powerful qualities of the feminine are caring, nurturing. We're lovers, we're connectors, we're empathic, we're from the heart. But when it becomes toxic is when it goes extreme, mm -hmm. right? When now you're nice, but you're not nice to Lisa. Mm. When you're so adaptable, but you're compromising all your own values. Right? When that becomes extreme. In the same way, masculinity is what we all need too. We all need the feminine and the masculine. But when the masculine becomes toxic, right? When uh, good boundaries becomes violator of boundaries, that's toxic, mm. right? One is to have good boundaries. One is to in have such good boundaries, you, you invade other people's boundaries and don't care. Mm. Or uh, being logical is a masculine quality. But when the logicality becomes excessive rigidity, that's toxic, right? When it loses the heart. So I talk about these two principles in the book about be careful, where are you on the spectrum of masculinity and femininity and have both playing for you. Mm -hmm. But again, this takes self-awareness and the inner work. It takes you to be aware of yourself. Yeah, and, and also anger, correct? So you say, you know, we're taught to kind of, for females to move away from anger, but you actually, you know, talking about the masculinity, it's like, no, you need to harness the anger. Right. Anger doesn't have to be rage. Right. It doesn't have to be an alcoholic blackout. It doesn't have to be abuse of another human being. Anger is a powerful protest against inequity, inequality, injustice. How can you not have anger? But you need to have conscious anger. Anger that is truly not dumping, not reactive, but really a protest for change. It is active in its action. It's not just complaining. It's not to destroy anyone. It is truly to stand for what you believe with a declarative commitment. That's how I look at anger. But not, you know, taking any prisoners, not being wa waffling in any way, truly declaring a commitment to your value. Honestly, Dr. Shafali, I could talk to you forever, Me girl. Too. We literally just touched on like one tiny section of your book, yes. but please tell everyone where they can find you, where they can pick up the book and all that good stuff. Absolutely. So they can get this book at my website, drshafali.com. I'm doing a course on this. I do many courses for parents, for uh, relationships and to become more conscious. So yeah, drshafali.com. Thank you for having mm -hmm. me, Lisa. Oh. Oh my God, it's been an honor. Guys, guys, go check out this woman. It was so much fun reading her book. So seriously, go pick her up right now. If you're not following her, go follow her. Go check out her website. And if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if this episode brought you value, please, please do subscribe. Click that link right there. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of badassery, make sure you watch this video right here because I know you like it. But hey, also, while you're here guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.